what can I tell you about me that might be, uh, might be of some use? Well, I also have roots to this part of London. My parents were born not far from here. My mother was born in Evering Road up in uh, Stoke Newington and my father was born in Leebridge Road over in Leighton. I was brought up in Chingford. Um, I'm the youngest of, uh, of three siblings. I've got a brother who's uh, five years my senior and a, a sister who's seven years my senior. And we didn't have a middle class upbringing. We had a fairly humble um, beginnings actually, um, fairly, fairly working class. And I'd always aspired to better myself. Um, I suppose I had quite a materialistic streak as a, as a young man. But nevertheless, I still managed to, uh, to fudge my way through school and um, I got to um, O levels, what you call GCSEs these days, and did spectacularly badly. And then managed to convince my parents I was really going to try very, very hard for A levels. And then proceeded to have uh, what I now refer to as my gap years. Because um, I didn't actually work at all for two years. Um, I was far too immature at 16 to get a job. So I thought, well, you know, let's hitch a ride for a bit. And I had a great time. It was brilliant. But when I left school, I thought, well, hang on a second. Um, what am I going to do now? Um, didn't go to university, something I regret to this day. And um, so I applied to enter the police force. That doesn't make me a bad person. But um, it seemed a good idea at the time. The police were fairly well paid, good pensions. Everything seemed great. And I was just certain as an arrogant 18 year old that the police was just waiting for me. But it turned out they weren't uh, because they rejected me. But in the meantime, what I'd done was uh, my father wouldn't let me sit around and just wait for, um, to, to get this great career in, uh, in the police. So uh, I had to go and get a job. And one of our neighbours gave me a job just working in a warehouse. Um, he had run a packaging business and uh, it was just a tied over job. But then once I got the rejection from the police force, I thought, well, what do I do now? Um, I don't want to work in a warehouse for the rest of, my, the rest of my life, not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but I had high aspirations and I wanted to go places. And so I asked this guy if, um, if there were any vacancies working in the office, and there were, so I went to work in the office, and the company that I was working for then relocated. We went to Stratford, and that was a bit too far for me to commute. And so I managed to find a better job, much, much nearer to home, where I met a bunch of guys who were serious, serious entrepreneurs, very, very clever, very good at what they did. And we were making lots of money for the owner of this business. And um, we thought, well, you know, this is a great business. We really love what we do. Uh, happy to make money for this guy, but one day he's going to give us a share of the equity. One day we're going to be rewarded for all that we've been doing for him. And one day we came in and found he'd actually sold the business. <laughs> so we thought, well, what do we do now? We either put up and shut up or we do something about it. And so we decided that uh, we would start our own business in direct competition. So we all resigned en masse, and this was back in 1987 when I was a fresh-faced 23-year-old. And, uh, and so we started our own business. We had no money, no nothing. Uh, but we just believed that we could make a go of a business. Now at this stage in my life, I wasn't a Christian. Um, but very soon afterwards, um, my brother, who is, uh, as I said earlier, is five years my senior, he'd been a Christian for a while. And um, he'd really worked on me. He'd said, look, come to church. And uh, there's just a verse from scripture I'd like to, uh, like to share with you. It comes from John's Gospel, um, which showed exactly what my brother did um, for me. Um, it's John chapter 1, verses 40 to 42, if I can read it. Um, is it Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him. And my brother did the self-same thing to me. He came to tell me the gospel, but I wasn't interested. But in 1988, he got married to a really, really lovely girl. And um, my brother and I had always been close, so I was invited along to various uh, events around that time, you know, stag night and um, various other bits and pieces. And my brother's friends were different to my friends. They were different in a good way. They were different in a positive way. When somebody walked out of the room, the person who left the room, they said nice things about them. They didn't say no, no backbiting, no nothing. I was attracted to these people. They were different. And shortly after um, my brother was married, um, one of his friends phoned me during the week and said, look, would you like to come around for tea on Sunday? And I knew what the angle was going to be. I know it's, oh, come for tea and we're all off to church. Would you like to come? I knew that was going to be the angle because, you know, I didn't really do tea in those days. It wasn't a cool thing to do. But the phone call came. Do you want to come to tea? Yes, I said. So I went for tea. And lo and behold, quarter to seven in the evening, we're all off to church now. Would you like to come? And I said, yes. Well, that was the first surprise for them. 
And I went to church and I was struck that evening because the person speaking was speaking from Romans chapter 8. And um, I found out then that the mind that is hostile to God cannot please God. And I realised then and there that was me. My mind was hostile to God. I was opposed to God. Or at least that's what this guy was telling, telling me. And I had to find out whether it was true. So the following Sunday, I phoned my brother in the afternoon. I said, what are you doing this evening? He said, we're going to church. I said, would you mind if I come? Well, there was a silence at the other end of the phone. I think he was picking his chin up off the floor. And after that, I never looked back. The Lord touched my life and changed me. Now, how does it affect you? Well, I've just started a new business. Um, we were going places. We wanted to, we wanted to set the world, world on fire. We, we, we had plans. But of course, the Lord sometimes stops you in your tracks. And he did me. How did I change? Well, the first thing that happened was I noticed my language changed. I swore a lot before I became a Christian. It just stopped. How did it stop? Oh, the Lord. My business practices, new business, I was now saying to my partners, no, we're going to be running this business ethically. We're going to be running it honestly, with integrity. They say about integrity, integrity is like virginity, you only lose it once. And I wasn't planning on losing mine lightly. And so the business continued to do well, and uh, we went from strength to strength. And over the years, um, we, we got to the stage where we were employing 80 people. Once again, it was a packaging business, and uh, so we had 80 staff. Um, the money was starting to pour in. When you start a business um, with, with partners, the most fun times are the hard times, the difficult times, the, the, the bit at the beginning when you've really got to grind, grind away to make, uh, to make ends meet. When the money starts to come in, that's when the problems come. My partners weren't Christians, I was. Immediately there's a conflict there. One of my partners, to give you an idea of just, uh, just how sad he was, he was looking for something, but he was never going to find it where he was looking. He changed cars like you might change socks. In one year, he had a Bentley, a Jaguar, a TVR, a Ferrari, and an Aston Martin. Not one of them made him happy. Now, it just so happened that there were four of us started the business. Um, I was the youngest by a few years. And, uh, and when we got to, um, to 2001, my oldest, um, oldest partner retired. And that changed the dynamic on the board completely. Um, two's company, three's a crowd. I was on holiday, and um, I knew that uh, a few days after getting back from holiday, I was going to be having a fairly serious knee operation. My partners knew that too. And I got back from holiday, and one of these partners was one of my closest friends. Even though he wasn't a Christian, he was one of my closest friends. So I got back from holiday, came into the office, thought everything was fine. He said, can I have a word? Walked down to the office. The other partner walked in, sat down. Everything all right, guys? No. We've decided we're going to make you redundant. Well, you can imagine how I felt. These were my friends. These were people we'd started out in business together. We'd done everything together. We'd been through the hard times. We were now in the good times. Why were they going to make me redundant? Well, it was obvious why they were going to make me redundant. I was drawing a salary, a good salary. They wanted more money for themselves. It was greed. So how did I respond? Well, my immediate reaction was, I can't really believe this is happening. But God intervenes in these situations. I could have got angry. I could have started shouting. I could have reverted back to using bad language. I could have done all manner of things. But I didn't. The Lord said, said to me, he, he just spoke the words of Proverbs into my head. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. So I knew when those words came into my head, I wasn't to get angry, I wasn't to try and get retribution, I wasn't to do any of those things. I was to just take it. Take it and roll with the punches. Now, a hard thing to do. I, had it. I, I was married by now. Um, my wife, Jane, um, we had three young children um, who were then five, three and one, respectively. So I had responsibilities. Now I didn't have an income. I had no means of selling the shares I had in the business because the only people who would buy them were my partners. And they didn't want them because they knew that it didn't make any difference to them really whether, whether I kept them or not. And so there I was in, in a very awkward predicament. But once again, the Lord intervened. Because several years earlier, uh, somebody had tried to headhunt me in the same business in the packaging industry. And this guy was just starting a new business. Now, businesses don't start up 
every day, particularly in the sector that we were working in. And I phoned him just to see if there was any chance, not really believing there was much, uh, much opportunity for me. And he said, you know, he said, I was hoping you were going to get in touch. He said, I've been wanting to employ you for years. He said, the guy who was supposed to be running the southeast region for this new business has let us down. Come on board. And so I did. I stepped in. But it was a different sort of business. If you wanted to work for this business, you had to own shares. Whether you're a truck driver, warehouseman, office person, you had to buy shares. And I thought, this opportunity is good. So I invested in this business and I invested in it really, really as, as much as I could afford to invest. Now, this wasn't my happiest time working because um, the business did very, very well. But um, my part of the world was not doing as well as the others. And, uh, and I was quite mindful of that. I've been used to being successful and, uh, and I wasn't being as successful as I'd, I'd hoped and wanted to be. And so after, after a few years in 2009, um, I agreed that it was the right time for me to leave the business. Um, but the lovely thing was, what I'd invested had grown very, very, um, to, to, to a great degree. And so uh, I got back about five times as much as I put in, which was just a, a real blessing. In the meantime, my other business, which I'd left the shares in, thinking that, um, not knowing what would happen to them, I'd had a phone call from one of my partners saying, we want to buy your shares. I thought, hang on, that's strange. Why are they suddenly getting all friendly with me? And I thought, wow, the business must be up for sale. And lo and behold, I wouldn't sell to them. I got a phone call from the accountants a little while later saying, we've sold the business, you're going to get paid out full value. So I got two windfalls in the space of a couple of years. And that left me in a position where I thought, well, this is great. I don't have to work anymore. So I retired. I retired six weeks short of my 45th birthday. And I was rubbish at being retired. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> really be careful what you wish for. Because I'd always wanted, I thought, yeah, retire young, it'll be great. It's not great. Not when you're young, not when, you, not when you've still got plenty of energy left in you. So I thought back, well, you know, what, what, what are the regrets I've got in my life? Well, I thought, well, I regret not going to university. I regret being an idiot when I was a teenager. So I thought, well, yeah, right, let's go to university. What shall I study? Well, I'd wanted to be a policeman. I've always been interested in the law. I'm going to study the law. So my wife came home from work and I said, I've decided what I'm going to do. She said, great, what are you going to do? So I'm going to study law. She said, what? So I'm going to study law. She said, why? I said, well, I wanted to pick an easy one. Anyway, um, I tucked into a law degree. In the meantime, um, I had a next door neighbour who was another of my closest friends, a Christian man. He was a church warden. He was a local magistrate. He'd been a stockbroker and uh, he'd had to retire young because he had a degenerative kidney condition. And um, he was really one of my closest confidants and, uh, and, a, and a really, really good friend. And he said to me, look, you know, you've helped my family quite a lot because um, when, he, when he'd lost his job, I'd, I'd helped him financially. He said, you've done such a lot for me. He said, why don't I try and do for you some of what you've done for me? He said, why don't, why don't you give me some money to invest on your behalf? I'm a stockbroker. I can make it grow. So I thought, great. So I handed over some money. He said, I've got some more investments come up now. Invest some more. So I handed this guy over quite a large sum of money because he's going to invest it for me and it's all going to be great. But then what I found out while I was working my way through my, uh, through my law degree in 2013, on a, in May 2013, I got, got a phone call from this guy. And he said, Rob, I've got something to tell you. I said, Patrick, what's, what, what's the trouble? He said, I've been lying to you all this time. He said, I haven't been investing your money. I've been gambling it. I've lost a lot. Another bump in the road. What do you do? I'm a Christian. He's supposed to be my Christian brother. How do you respond? Do you get angry? Do you start shouting? Do you start screaming? That's what a lot of people did, because I found out he'd done the same thing to an awful lot of other people in the church. In fact, he got away with 3.3 million pounds of other people's money. You want to see the devil at work in a church? You let somebody come in with a big fraud like that and you see how divisive it is. It was catastrophic. So what do I do? He told me all these things. I said, I'm really disappointed. I didn't scream, I didn't shout, I didn't swear. My dignity was worth more to me than that. But I was angry. I was angry. And the Lord works in mysterious ways, because I've had a lot uh, of, of dealings over the years with the youth in the church, and I lead the pathfinders <coughs> sometimes. And call it irony. I don't believe really uh, in, in, in coincidence. But, uh, but that Sunday, the Lord had laid on my heart weeks earlier that I was going to do forgiveness with the kids. I was going to talk to them about forgiveness. And one of the verses which I'd uh, picked to, when, when talking about forgiveness uh, comes from um, 
Matthew's Gospel, where it says, uh, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So I knew that I had to forgive this guy. I had to forgive him for what he'd done, because if I didn't forgive him, the Lord wouldn't forgive me. It says it in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So I had no alternative. We had a big meeting at church where everybody who was affected by the fraud was invited and I stood up in front of everybody, I said, we need to forgive this man. I was shouted down, I was told, don't, you don't know what you're talking about, you're an idiot. I said, we have to forgive this man, I should quote his scripture. I was an idiot. But I know I did the right thing. I know I did the right thing before my Lord, who's given me everything. Anyway, as time went on, um, that, that was behind me. That's another of the bumps in the road. I'm getting used to the fact now I'm not very good at choosing best friends, because that's two of them now who've, uh, who've turned me over. But now I'm into the realms of coming towards the end of my law degree. And the law degree was the focus. This was, this was the prize. I'd been doing quite well with the studies. And I knew if I did really well in the last module, I could get a first class degree. If I didn't do so well, well, I'd still get an upper second, which would be great because I wanted to go, I wanted to study to be a barrister after that. Either of those grades would do me fine. And so I came to my final exam and I went into that exam with such expectations and I came out feeling sick. The exam was a disaster. Everything went wrong. None of the questions looked right. I came out, my friends were all going off to celebrate finishing the degree. I've been all set to go out with them. I said, do you mind if I don't? I've got this sick feeling in the pit of my gut. I just want to go home. And I went home, I told my wife, I said, that's it. That's the end of my legal career. It would have been nice if I had a second career, but obviously the Lord didn't want it to happen. But the Lord's telling me something. He's saying, look, you're doing it in your own strength, boy. You don't do it in your strength, you do it in my strength. And I, I, I was so flat, and the results weren't coming out for a while. And I started to think, God, you know, why have you done this? Why, why, why? You know, you've held my hand through life every step of the way, and I know I have just trashed this exam. Anyway, the results day came, and uh, I had to look on the internet to see how I'd done. And I opened up, and I got a first class degree. <laughs> Humanly speaking, that hadn't happened. And the Lord was telling me, do you know what? He said, if you're going to use this degree, I said, your legal career isn't over. If you're going to use this degree, you're going to use it, but you're going to use it for me. You're not going to use it for yourself. You're going to use it for me. I've given it to you, so use it. So now I'm in a position where I'm waiting to start studying for the bar exams so to become a barrister, which starts in September. In the meantime, I've been volunteering at Christian Concern, which is where I met Tyro. Christian Concern are a pressure group. They pressure government for Christian issues. All the time we're saying to government, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. The Lord Jesus wouldn't do that. You probably read about Christian Concern in the paper or hear about them on the radio or on the, on the BBC News quite regularly. But the other side of the business, this is the bit I want to get involved in, is the Christian Legal Centre. And what Christian Legal Centre does is it stands up for people in employment or any walk of life, actually, where they've been persecuted for their Christian faith and we try and turn the law to their advantage. We try and use the law to get justice for these people. But you know what? It doesn't happen very often. Most of the cases which Christian Concern, Christian Legal Centre contest, we lose. But you know, if you see God at work in all this, because what do we do when we lose? Well, we appeal. So it moves up the courts. It moves up the profile in the media. People are hearing the gospel through the suffering of people, people losing their jobs because they know Jesus. But that's what I want to do. That's, that's my next focus. My next focus in life is to think, where would Jesus have me placed in this, in this organisation? What can I do for his glory? And that is what I want to do. So if I'm going to give you anything to, um, uh, to, to feast on, I suppose, this evening, first of all, is if you've got a heart for business, I had a heart for business, go for it. Give it all you've got. Make money. There's nothing wrong with making money. As Christians, when you make money, make sure you share it out. We have a duty to spread it around. It funds mission, it funds ministry. Without it, we can't do it. So go for it, make money. But the other thing I'd like to say is, when things are going well, rejoice in the Lord. When things are going badly, rejoice in the Lord. It all belongs to him, he gives it all to us, he can take it away at any time, but he's a good God, and he looks after us. So that's what, I, that's what I praise him for. But live your lives in a way that's different. Live your lives in a way that doesn't conform to the world. In your places of work, 
whether you're senior manager, whether you're middle, whether you're at the bottom, it doesn't matter. Live your life so that you're different. Like my brother's friends were different to me. Live your life so that you are different, but you're different for Jesus. Different in a way that's attractive. Different in a way that makes people think, why is that guy different? Why is that girl different? What have they got that I haven't got? I want that. And then you'll be faithful servants of the Lord Jesus. I hope you found that in some way helpful. God bless you all.